there we go good morning everybody thanks for joining me type in the comments where you're checking in from it is a glorious day here in farmington missouri thanks for joining me live on instagram to find out the truth who is the antichrist oh <laughs> So before I get into today's walk talk, um, just in case you're new to my ministry, my name is Matt McMillan. I'm a Christian author. I've written seven books. All my books are available on Amazon in paperback and Kindle. Check them out if you get some time. Oh, they're also available on hardcover. I forget to say that because, <laughs> because I re-released all seven of my books on hardcover a couple months ago and I did some updates on some of the devotionals. So check them out if you get some time um, now if you have read any of my books i would greatly appreciate a review go back to amazon leave me a quick review and those are very encouraging to me i also have a podcast the name of my podcast is called walk talks with matt mcmillan and i am recording the latest episode live on instagram this is where i typically record them and I got some big news today in regard to my walk talks this is episode 250 <laughs> so it's a pretty big accomplishment for me and I'm pretty proud of that I never would have thought I would have kept doing these when I first started out, out these walk talks I was just on my walks because I do walks every day um, a few days a week and I was like I'm gonna do a live on Instagram and it kind of turned into a thing had some requests for me to put these on a podcast, which I did, and then on YouTube, which I did. So, which brings me to the next part of my introduction. Check me out on YouTube. Maybe there's a particular topic you're wondering about. Maybe what I'm saying is interesting and you just want to dive deeper. Go to my YouTube channel. I had somebody reach out to me this morning and ask me about fellowship because many people think that they can lose their fellowship with God. Then they got to do some stuff to get back in fellowship. And um, you can find everything I've done on every particular topic, including fellowship. All you got to do is go to my YouTube channel, type in the word fellowship on my YouTube page, and it'll populate. I've done a walk talk on fellowship. Can Christians lose fellowship? Um, also, on my website, on my topics page, you can search fellowship there. I've done a full chapter in one of my books on the first chapter of 1 John. Check that out or any particular topic, okay? Um, what else? Oh, I'm not a pastor. I'm a regular person just like you. Nothing against people who have the title of pastor, but according to the Bible, the word pastor is not a title. It's not even a position. It's a spiritual gift. So what we see today in our modern church is not biblical. I, I know it's hard to hear. <laughs> I get it because tradition of men dies hard and that's what we see today. A lot of man-made traditional practice, and we just ignore what the Bible says. We try to superimpose tradition of men onto the Bible, but it's easier. It's more burden-free. It's more light. And who does that come from? <laughs> it comes from Jesus. And Jesus said, it will not be like this among you. You will not lord over one another. Matthew chapter 20. But yet we have people with a title of pastor, elder, deacon, whatever you want to say, and they lord over others. So according to what Jesus said, it's not biblical. The only way you can come up with that is if you superimpose what happened through the early church fathers who were in error. <laughs> Just because it's old doesn't mean it's true. The early church was screwing things up from the beginning, but also the Reformation in the 16th century, they created even more classes and that's not how the body of Christ operates. We're a group with many members. Nobody's in charge. That's hard to understand. But um, if you're new to my ministry, stick with me. I think I can help you understand that as well. All right. Also, if you want to contact me, it's really easy to get a hold of me. Go to my website. Go over to the contact page. I'll be glad to interact with you there. Okay, so let's get to today's walk talk. Who is? The Antichrist. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> oh, it's it's Donald Trump. McMillan, I know it's it's the orange face. Whatever you want to call him. <laughs> um, no, it's not Trump. It's Biden. Biden is the... Oh, no, it's not Biden. He's not smart enough. It's Obama. <laughs> and then, you know, we turn 
political figures into somebody with the title of Antichrist. Oh no, it's AI. Oh no, it's, oh no, it's, oh no, it's. And then we try to label who is the Antichrist. It's got to be this political figure. It's got to be this political figure. No, it's got to be this. It's got to be that. It's got to be the. Do, 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 do. Some even say it's Nero. Oh, this was the first century. It was Nero. Well, does that add up in scripture as well? <laughs> Let's talk about that today. Okay, so when we go to the Bible and we search for the word antichrist how about we do that <laughs> that would probably make things a lot simpler but because of man-made tradition emotionalism through somebody on stage with a title or aggression or passive aggressiveness or daddy whoever you want to say. i'm gonna try to keep my impersonations in my pocket today because i got a little out of hand my last few walk talks so i got i got my mind made up today go easy on the impersonations okay so, if you are taught that there is an individual named Antichrist, that should be in the Bible, right? Yeah, it should be in the Bible. Because we're supposed to do this by the book, right? <laughs> we're not supposed to do this by, you know, just because somebody is super aggressive or super passive aggressive. Are we supposed to believe them then? No. Because you can believe anything. If, if it's fed to you or presented to you in certain ways and lots of error can be presented to you. So here's what we need to do. Let's get rid of all that stuff. Let's just clear that all off the table. Let's go to the Bible. Let's search some words. And I always recommend this. So this is how I study. So I'm going to share that with you. If there's any particular thing that you're struggling with in scripture, you know, I always recommend you guys um, search my YouTube channel, my podcast, my topics page. Well, here's what I search in order to come up with what's on my stuff. <laughs> Bible Gateway. Go to Bible Gateway. This is not a plug for Bible Gateway. It is a resource online where you can go and you can type in a word. Hmm. So we're going to talk about keep your sarcasm to a minimum, McMillan. <laughs> Try not to be sarcastic today, too, because sarcasm, you know, I struggle with that, too. Okay. Here's what I do, okay? I, and you don't have to do what I do, but this is what I do. Take it or leave it. But if I am going to find something out about a particular word, and I'm not exactly sure how many times it's in the Bible, where it's at exactly every single time, I'll go to Bible Gateway, I'll type that word in. Now here's what Bible Gateway is. It is a search engine for every single translation of the Bible. So if you go to Bible Gateway, you type in, antichrist when you type in antichrist on the right side of your screen if you're on a, a laptop a desktop it will populate every single time the word antichrist is used so you can see okay it's used in this letter this many times it'll have a little parentheses next to it it's used in this letter this many times it'll be in the parentheses next to it and you'll see it okay so you can search it okay but not only that you can go up to the top right hit the drop down menu you can search every single translation, even translations that <laughs> I don't think they should be translations, such as the Darby translation. Okay, <laughs> we're not going to go down that path today, but you could search it. So when you search the word Antichrist, we, here's this cat has really been following me around recently. Go on, kitty. Go on, kitty. It's a black cat. Cat looks awfully familiar. I had a black cat that we gave away a couple years ago. I wonder if that's her. Anyway, let me get across this road here, away from the golf course, away from the cat, and then I will continue this. So, when you search, when you search Bible Gateway, search Antichrist, search any word, and you search for Antichrist, this will give you who the Antichrist is. It'll give you the answers, okay? And we only see this word in two different letters, okay? First John, second John. That's it. Now, many people, they will say, oh, this is the Antichrist, the Antichrist, the 
as in an individual. Well, John does not say that there is the Antichrist. He says there are many Antichrists. Now, many people who have been taught a lot of stuff based on proof texting and tradition of men, they will say, well, this is one Antichrist after the next, after the next, after that. No, this is many. Also, he says they're already here. So they were already there. When was here now? <laughs> According to John, you know, the apostle, the disciple whom Jesus loved, <laughs> laid his chest on, laid his head on his chest. <laughs> The one who outran Peter. <laughs> the first century. So, and he tells you what an antichrist is. An antichrist is this. Anyone who says Jesus is not from God. Now, in context, John is battling a group called the Gnostics. The Gnostics are still alive today, alive and well today, this, this belief system. Here's what the Gnostics believed. The Gnostics believed that Jesus did not come in the flesh. This is why John says, test the spirits. Many people say, oh, I got a spirit of discernment. I can test the spirits. Well, th your spirit of discernment is not testing the spirits. According to the Bible, you're talking about your judgmental attitudes towards people. According to test the spirits, John tells you, how do you test the spirits? <laughs> do they say Christ came in the flesh? So if, if the Gnostics said Christ came in the flesh, they would not be Gnostics because Gnostics believe there's something bad with your flesh. Your flesh is bad. Hmm? We see Gnosticism taught in many pulpits claiming to be Christian. When Paul said that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, he said, as you care for your body like Christ cares for the church. Whole nother walk talk. But the Gnostics said... Jesus did not come in the flesh. G oh, here's another thing they said. They said, Jesus, excuse me. They said, sin is not a real thing. You ever heard that? You stupid Christian sin. You guys are just making up sin. You're making up sin just to control the world. We, we see that today. <laughs> sin is real. Okay. Sin is real. It's a real thing. This is why I say, if we, that's why he said, if we say we have no sin, <laughs> We deceive ourselves and the truth is not in you. But if you will confess, he will forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. All means all. So this is an invitation to the Gnostics to test them out. Are they saying Jesus came in the flesh? Okay, great. Do they say that they have sin that needs to be forgiven? Okay, great. <laughs> They're from God. They're not Antichrist. Antichrist says the opposite of that. Antichrist is anything anti Christ, anti-gospel. False prophets, Matthew chapter 7. We're going to talk about that today, Matthew chapter 7, because many people will say, no, you're a false prophet because of... And then they'll fill in the blank, accuse you of something because your theology doesn't match up to theirs, like a puzzle piece. But Jesus tells us exactly what a false prophet is. Anybody who says he's not the Messiah. So you got false prophets, antichrist, they're against people. They're against anything that is pro-gospel, pro-Jesus, pro who Christ is. Now, you could struggle. I'm not saying you're a Christian. I'm not saying you're not a Christian because you struggle with certain things. Here's how you know if you're a Christian. You've trusted Jesus. It's that simple. You've trusted Jesus, but you're still struggling with behavioralism because you grew up in this particular behavioralism focused community, household, church. You sat under the thumb of somebody named pastor. You thought that God was like this person on stage and he's not. It doesn't mean you're anti-Christ. It doesn't mean you're not a Christian. It means you're human. <laughs> we all can struggle. Okay, but anti-Christ, according to the Bible, is not a particular individual. It is anybody who is against Christ. Anybody who says Christ is not the Messiah. Anybody who says Christ did not come in the flesh. Anybody who says sin is not a real thing. So that's one flavor of Antichrist. Then you got another flavor of Antichrist, the false prophets, which were coming from the group of the circumcision. Those teaching the law. The lawless one is antichrist but not the antichrist because according to the bible there is no 
individual person with the title of Antichrist or called Antichrist. You've got a lawless one. So you'd have to jump over from first and second John, you'd have to go over to second Thessalonians and say, right here, this is the Antichrist, the lawless one. What are you talking about? And then they'd have to attack me that way. <laughs> but here's what's interesting to me. The lawless one is never described as the Antichrist. As a matter of fact, he, he is not even accused of being Antichrist, even though he is, clearly, because he does not say Jesus came from God. And that's how John describes anybody who is Antichrist. But if we go over to 2 Thessalonians, we can see an individual called the lawless one. Now, due to <laughs> pop culture, also, proof texting, also, man-made tradition, you might think that the lawless one is the Antichrist, as in an individual person, specifically a political figure, and this political figure will A, B, and C, and I'm going to get into the A, B, and C, but here's the first thing I want to point out about how the lawless one cannot be a political figure. Two main reasons. First of all, the lawless one followed the law of Moses. I'm going to dive deep into that. But the lawless one also was around during the first century. Oh no, Macmillan, you're talking about post mid pre tribulation blah blah. No, 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 none of that. No. Let's, like I said, let's get that off the table. Let's get your emotionalism, your man-made tradition off the table. Let's just go to the Bible, look at the Bible, read it based on the context, read it based on who it's directed at, what they were facing at that time. And as far as the word tribulation, did you know the word tribulation is never capitalized in the Bible? As in an event? We never see the words, the tribulation. If you think that there is an event, a time period, or a certain age called the tribulation, you have been taught tradition of men, which is ignoring scripture. Because if you search for the word tribulation in the Bible, not one time does it ever describe an event. Please search it. Search the scriptures. Well, what is it then, McMillan, if it's not an event? <laughs> Their head explodes. <laughs> Cognitive dissonance dies hard. Trust me, I get it. Cognitive dissonance is you've been taught something for so long by so many people. But then you finally realize that's not true. And you, you know that it's not true. But you ignore that and you look for any other reason to... Believe what you currently believe. That's the same thing that happens with everything eschatology. Everything about the word tribulation. Because search the word tribulation. I did a full walk talk on this. Go to my YouTube channel. Search tribulation. <laughs> the word tribulation never describes an event, a time period. Nothing like that. It always describes great trouble. Great trouble and persecution. Oh, that's it, that's it. No, it's not an event. Search every single time it's mentioned. It's always describing what's going on right then or what is about to happen based on what is being told. It never describes an event. You would have to superimpose man-made tradition and proof texting onto the Bible. So let's take a little sidestep, a side note over here for a little bit. You, you, you hear me talk about this word proof texting. If you're new to my ministry, you might not know what that is. Proof texting was created by a group of individuals called the Protestant Scholastics in the 16th century. Now, in the 16th century, before the Protestant Scholastics could actually begin proof texting, I'm going to explain exactly what it is in just a minute, there was a man who added individual numbers all throughout the Bible. You got chapters, which were added in the 13th century, 
only for easy referencing so you can find stuff in the Bible quicker. Chapters, not for context, just for easy searching. But not only that, verses as in the number, like John chapter one, verse one, verse two, verse three, those individual numbers were added in the 16th century by a man riding on horseback over in Europe. And he added those verses, not for context, but only for easier searching than just chapters. So if you go to the Bible and you search it, and then you select, let's just say, uh, 1 John chapter 1 through 1 John uh, chap First John chapter 1, 1 verse through 1 John chapter 1, 10. And let's say you take verses 1 through 10 of the first chapter of 1 John and you pull it out and you build a doctrine on it. But you take that, then you go over to James chapter 5 and you take that and you, you, you mash that together. So you base this section of verses and this section of verses together. What was happening in James? Was James writing to the Gnos about the Gnostics to an early group of the Ecclesia? No, James is writing to the 12 tribes. The context is completely different. <laughs> John is writing to an early group of the Ecclesia, little children, he calls them young Christians. So if you take this section and you take that section and you mash it together, that's proof texting. Okay, so the Protestant scholastic started this. John Darby in the 19th century perfected proof texting. And when he perfected proof texting, he took 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 about the lawless one, okay? 1 John chapter 1, or 1 John, 2 John, also with the lawless one. So you got the lawless one from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. You got 1 John, 2 John with the Antichrist. But then <laughs> he went over to Matthew 24, where Jesus is describing Rome's invasion, on, which was going to happen in the year AD 70 on Jerusalem. Took Matthew 24. You're going to be left behind because the lawless one's coming. Who is the Antichrist? Who will stick it all together? Proof texting. Matthew was not written in chapters. Matthew was not written in verses. John, 1 John, 2 John, not written in chapters, not written in verses. 2 Thessalonians, first, uh, also 1 Thessalonians. You'll be caught up in the sky. We then go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Pull that out. Matthew 24, you'll be left behind. All of these things, you better stop sinning. Then they'll go to Matthew chapter 7. You, Depart from me, I never knew you. See what we're doing? So you prove text. That's what John Darby did. So if you proof text, you would be in egregious error. You have to read every single letter based on what was happening. Why was this letter written to the Thessalonians? Why was this letter written to the group who John was writing to in 1 John and 2 John, 3 John? I explained 1 John. Let's talk about 2 Thessalonians and 1 Thessalonians. Because if you're going to say that the Antichrist is the lawless one, you would have to proof text from 1 John, proof text from 2 John, talked about what that was about. Let's go over to 2 Thessalonians and 1 Thessalonians. Before I talk about uh, 2 Thessalonians, what, what's happening in Thessalonians? This is a Greek city. Thessalonica. <laughs> if that's not a Greek word, I don't know what else is. So you got Paul who established the gospel in Thessalonica. And here's what happened. Unbelieving Judaizers were coming in behind him, trying to dissuade these Greeks from the message about Jesus by saying, no, we have the lineage. We are Jewish. Jesus was Jewish. You have to keep parts of the law or you have to keep the law. Lawless one, lawless and many people say, oh, no, the lawless one, they will be telling that you could just sin, that it is this sin and this sin, and they will just, no, it's not. Lawless is describing somebody who is attempting to teach the law. Because if you want to teach the law, 
You must do it perfectly. This is not random lawlessness. <laughs> this is not the law of your local land right now. This is not lawlessness of America, lawlessness of Europe. Wherever you're at listening to this, watching this, South Africa, Australia, Canada, eh? <laughs> Don't you know? This the lawless verse. When you see lawless, that is not talking about your local law of the land. It is describing the law of Moses. So what is the law of Moses? Okay, so when Moses freed the people from slavery in Egypt out into the wilderness through the Red Sea floor, went out to the wilderness and he established what's called the law. The law is 613 commandments, not just 10. Only 10 of the 613 are attempted to be followed. But well, nine plus tithing because nobody's really obeying the Sabbath because that's on Saturday. But here's the thing, if you want to follow the law, you must do it perfectly. If you don't, you'll be lawless. That's the perfection requirement. Now, where am I getting this from? Okay, so Paul says the lawless one in 2 Thessalonians delights in unrighteousness. Oh, right there, McMillan, I gotcha. Delight in unrighteousness, this is all that all that stuff that you see on the TV and all your music and you doing your little dance up in the club, all your drinking, smoking, looking at the porn. That's a lawless, that's unrighteous. No, hold on. That's a different flavor of unrighteousness. There's still, that's, that, you know, that can still be unrighteous, but not according to the law. Okay, according to the law, unrighteousness is not following the law of Moses perfectly. It's got to be done perfectly. James chapter 2. Verse 10 says, if you break one commandment, you've broken them all. Not just 10. <laughs> 613. And many people think, oh no, we need the 10. Do we? Because in Romans chapter 7, Paul is sinning more based on one of the 10. Thou shalt not covet. Also, a couple other things about the law. Deuteronomy 4.2 says this. Now get this. <laughs> do not add to, but not just that. Do not take away from. It was a package deal. Let's say I went into my local gas station. I seen a 30 pack of Diet Pepsi. I like drinking Diet Pepsi. I open up that 30 pack of Diet Pepsi. I take out two sodas, put them up or pops, wherever you're at on the country, <laughs> two pops, set them up on the counter. And I tell the clerk, I just want to get these two sodas. He's like, He's, he's going to say, no, you can't do that. You got to buy the whole thing. It's a package deal. You got to do that with the law. So if you want to follow the law, you got to follow all 613, not just the moral part. You got to follow the dietary part, the wardrobe, everything, the tithing part. And tithing is 23.3%, not just 10. By the time you do the math on the Jewish calendar. So if you want to follow the law, it must be perfect like God. Jesus says so. <laughs> Matthew 5, 48. So if you read Matthew chapter 5 through Matthew chapter 7, Jesus lays down the gauntlet on the requirements of following the law to people who thought they were following the law, but they were teaching lawlessness. Not only teaching lawlessness, but they were workers of lawlessness. So the lawless one is somebody who is really good at teaching the law. <laughs> a specific individual who was alive at that time, going from city to city to city, creating chaos for Paul. Every single letter Paul wrote, he lamented about this person or these people who was with this person. Every single letter except for one. Philemon. Or Philemon. However you want to say it. But just that one letter written about the escaped slave. That was the only letter he did not talk about. The thorn in his flesh. Those who were appearing as angels of light. Those who delighted in unrighteousness. Now, the law is not unrighteous. So we're not saying that <laughs> the law is still in effect for today. It has not gone away. 
It has not been destroyed, but it has been abolished for everybody who will believe. It's the same thing as slavery in America. Slavery has been abolished. Yeah, you're not under that. But if you want to put yourself under slavery, you go right ahead. Go right ahead. Follow the law. Put yourself under it. See what happens. But you're, you're putting yourself under something that, that's been abolished. We see in Colossians chapter 2, as well as in Ephesians, the law has been abolished. Many people will go to what Matthew said. Oh, no, Jesus said he did not come to abolish the law. Well, the original translation doesn't say abolish. It actually says destroy. And it hasn't been destroyed. I've got it on my phone right now in my notes. I could pull up all 613 commandments. I could read each one to you. You would be bored to tears before I finished. (laughs) You got to follow it all. You got to be perfect like God. Because if you're not, you're lawless. You're teaching lawlessness. You are a worker of lawlessness. This is why we see in Matthew 7 where he says, depart from me. I never knew you. And people just stop right there. But here's the key words. You workers of lawlessness. Same chapter, he calls them false prophets because they said he is not the Messiah. So you got the antichrist message. (laughs) You're not the Messiah. That's what an antichrist is. But then you also have lawlessness, which is perfection. (laughs) You got to do it perfectly. If you're not, you are teaching lawlessness. People, lawlessness. You know, Paul said this to Timothy. They want to be teachers of the law and they don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> First Timothy 1, 7. Then he continues. Now get this. He says, First Timothy 1, 9. The law is not for the righteous. So in... Ephesus, where Timothy was, there was the synagogue and you had the Judaizers who were teaching the law to the Gentiles (laughs) in Ephesus. False doctrine, Paul says in the first chapter. Remain in Ephesus, Timothy, so that you can combat false false doctrine, the myths and the endless genealogies. The myths were coming from the temple of Artemis, where they said men are bad, women are good. (laughs) Eve was not deceived because Artemis cannot be deceived. But we want to go to that passage and say a woman is, you know, whatever. I'm not going on that path today. But you got the myths at the temple of Artemis. But you also have the synagogue. We see over in Acts chapter 19, the synagogue in Ephesus. Timothy is still battling the synagogue in Ephesus. They were teaching their endless genealogies. What is endless genealogies? Read some of the parts of the Old Testament. You will be bored to tears as you read every person begat so-and-so, begat so-and-so, begat so-and-so, begat so-and-so. We have the lineage. Who are you, Timothy? You are half Greek, half Jew. Stay there, Timothy. I know it's difficult. They want to be teachers of the law. They don't know what they're talking about. Remember, Timothy, the law is not for the righteous. Romans 3.20 says, nobody will be righteous with God through the law. And the lawless one who we want to say is the Antichrist is some bad person teaching you to do bad stuff. No, it is actually somebody teaching behavioralism. Thou shalt obey these commandments in the book of the law. I delight in the law. (laughs) Psalms chapter one, they delighted and they meditated on the law. We don't do that. (laughs) Why? We have the spirit. Second Corinthians chapter three says that ministry is a ministry of death and condemnation. You want to follow the commandments in the law? You are going to sin more. Look at Romans chapter 7, sinning of every kind. (laughs) Romans chapter 6, sin is going to be your master if you're going to put yourself under the law. But 2 Corinthians chapter 3 describes a different ministry. It's hard to fathom because lawlessness is so widely taught in the box church. 
What's this ministry? It's the original ministry. The ministry of the Spirit. God in you. God guiding you gracefully. Never punishing you. Because Christ was punished. If Christ was not punished, yes. The Holy Spirit will never lead you into any type of sinning. But you will still sin. Because you're still on planet Earth. And you're still forgiven. And you're still righteous. Two chapters later, Paul calls this the ministry of reconciliation. Complete reconciliation. Hmm. Complete reconciliation with your creator. You are completely reconciled. Not through the law. And if you're a Gentile, you never had it. It's not your mail. Ephesians chapter 2 says you were without hope in regard to that covenant. You're reading somebody else's mail. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. Jesus' commandments are not the commandments in the law. The book of 1 John tells us what his commandments are. Believe and love. And his commands are not burdensome. Everything in the book of the law is burdensome. All of it. That's why it's called a ministry of death and condemnation. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, you have complete reconciliation with God. Yeah, but I'm sinning. I'm sinning a lot. I know. And that caused Christ to have to do what he did on the cross. This is why it's such a big deal that you make a bigger deal out of what Jesus has done. Romans chapter 5 verse 1 says you have peace with God. Why? He continues because of Jesus. Romans 5, 9, you are saved from the wrath of God. Why? Because of the blood of Jesus. You've, you're reconciled. Reconciliation takes two parties, by the way. If I want to reconcile with somebody and they don't want to reconcile with me, we are not reconciled. <laughs> so God reconciled himself to you through his son. And we are pleading on God's behalf to be reconciled. Trust Jesus. Turn from behavioralism. You don't need it. You've got the spirit. But this person who we want to name the Antichrist, who is not the Antichrist, is the lawless one, would never tell you these things. 2 Corinthians 5.19 says this, and I guarantee this lawless one would never say this. God no longer holds your sins against you. Well, the lawless one wouldn't teach you that. He would say, your, your sins are held against you. You need to go to the temple so that you can get forgiveness by way of animal blood. Would not say that. Your sins are held against you, I'll have you know. <laughs> Repent. Produce fruit and keep it up with repentance. Same message John the Baptist had. <laughs> And John the Baptist was the greatest prophet as he taught the law because the law was still in effect. But he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is why Jesus said he is the greatest prophet because he is prophesying about me as the Messiah. But we want to go to some of John's legalistic teachings where he's teaching the standards of the law and say, no, you need to. I got this hellfire and brimstone message just like John the Baptist. I ain't shot. Stop it, McMillan. Stop. Just stop. Oh, let me count down. <laughs> uh, five, four, three, two, one. And we're back. <laughs> oh, I'll tell you another thing that the lawless one would never say to you. You're righteous. Oh, there's not one righteous. That's what he'd say. Because he's teaching lawlessness. He's teaching the commandments in the law, which is a perfection requirement. But 2 Corinthians 5, where Paul is describing the ministry of reconciliation, he says, God no longer holds your sins against you, but not just that. <laughs> 
Jesus became sin so you could become righteous. <laughs> Do you think an antichrist, a lawless one, the antichrist would ever say such a thing? No, they would not. They would say, you better repent. They ignore everything about the wages of every sin, death, which would require Jesus to die. They judge you according to themselves. And what did Jesus say? <laughs> Delighted in unrighteousness as they taught the law. Paul even said this, they do the work in accord of Satan. Oh, right there, McMillan, I got you. What are you going to say? Get their teeth at me. <laughs> He's dead. Satan. The Satan is the Antichrist. Satan is the Antichrist. Satan is the law. No, hold on. This doesn't say Satan is the lawless one. It does, first of all, it doesn't say the Antichrist or Antichrist, because that's over in First and Second John. You got to go over there and proof text for that. But Antichrist is not over here in Second Thessalonians, so that's not proof text. Okay? <laughs> but it doesn't say that Satan is the Antichrist. It says the lawless one is doing the same works of Satan. What was Satan's original temptation in the garden? You will know good from evil. You'll know right from wrong. Yeah, you'll be more like God. All you need is more knowledge of good and evil, right from wrong. Law teaching. The lawless one is teaching you this is good, this is bad, according to this. They're not trusting the spirit for morality. They're in accord with the work of Satan, teaching behavioralism. No grace. As a matter of fact, it said they did not like grace. They don't want their hearts strengthened by grace. They would not obey the gospel. How do you obey the gospel? Believe. It is the obedience of faith. We see this all throughout the book of Romans. The obedience of faith is obeying the gospel. But they were in accord at the work of Satan. Now, if we go to John chapter 8, we can see that Jesus says, Your father is the devil. Who is he talking to? The woman caught in adultery? Nope. The woman at the well with, who clearly was having a problem being faithful? Nope. The tax collector, whom everybody rejected? Nope. He's talking about the one at the back of the building, beating his chest, saying, have mercy on me? Nope. He was talking about those who were looking to their behavior for righteousness, those teaching the law. And he said, your father is the devil. He said, if your father was God, you would love me. The lawless one did not love Jesus. The lawless one was teaching you, you better obey or else. That is the lawless one. Lawlessness is taught more in our pulpits today than any time in history. It is a behavior-focused, Christ-ignoring, covenant mixture, anti-Christ theology, which is taught. And that is happening today. Lives are ruined every day because of, oh, you better not forsake the assembly. And then you go to the assembly and this person is teaching lawlessness in accord with the work of Satan, an antichrist message. You are not completely forgiven. You got to repent. You are not completely righteous. There's not one righteous. You better get to work. Oh, you'll hear depart from me. I never knew you. But that's written to those who don't trust Jesus. Those who never did the will of the father. What is the will of the Father? Oh, you gotta. Oh, you gotta. Oh, you. The will of the Father is simple. Jesus says, John 6, 29 and John 6, 40. To believe in the one whom he has sent. The lawless one would never do such a thing. He was an evil and unbelieving man. Neither would anybody who is anti-Christ. The Gnostics would never say that about Jesus. We believe, we don't believe in Jesus. We have no sin. You guys are making this sin up. Jesus didn't come in the flesh. Our flesh is bad.
You know, when Paul wrote 2 Thessalonians and 1 Thessalonians, he was in Corinth. What was he dealing with in Corinth? The same thing. He even says, we are dealing with evil and unbelieving men as well. Pray for us. <laughs> but you got people in Thessalonica who somebody came in and was not only teaching them to obey the law, but some had even written letters or had prophecies or visions that Christ had already come. This is why he says, stop being idle. In the first letter, he says, encourage the idle. Pray without ceasing. He's encouraging in such a loving way in the first letter. The second letter, it's a little bit more harsh. <laughs> says, don't have anything to do with anybody who's idle. And he, you know, says, treat him as an unbeliever. <laughs> because there's so much work to do. And you do this from a state of grace. You do the most work from a state of rest. But these individuals, they were just sitting around. Jesus already came. Or Jesus is about to come. So by 2 Corinthians, excuse me, 2 Thessalonians, he says, in regard to the return of the Lord, don't believe anything unless it comes from us. <laughs> us, as in those who are teaching the gospel. And this part right here, where he says, these things are going to have to happen before Christ's return. Now, here's what will probably shock you. But this is what I believe. Take it or leave it. I just don't see any other way around it. So when he says that the lawless one will establish themselves in the temple, declare themselves as God, then Christ will return. Christ will destroy him. Okay, so we, we've got some options here. First of all, he specifically mentions the temple. This is not a random temple. This is the temple of the Jews. You had the first temple, which was built by Solomon. Before that, it was the tabernacle and the tent. Then he built an actual temple. And this is where all the animal sacrifices happened. Now, there were so many animal sacrifices that still had to be atoned for. I think it was 100,000 animals were killed to atone for the transgressions of the law. Temple work happens at the temple. Animal blood sacrifices for the forgiveness of sins. This is not church. There was no sermons. There was no tithes and offerings and praise and worship. None of that happened at the temple. The temple is not church. It is a place of bloody animal sacrifices for atonement annually for the forgiveness of sins, but also daily sacrifices, not for the forgiveness of sins, but so that you could draw near to God. The book of Hebrews says those sacrifices could never cause them to draw near to God. Sacrifices and offerings he has not desired. That temple was destroyed by the Babylonians. It's gone. The first temple's gone. Second temple was built. Now, this is a temple during Jesus' time. Same thing happened. Animal blood sacrifices. This is why Hebrews 10, 26 says, if you deliberately keep on sinning, there remains no sacrifice for sins. Where is that? The temple. What's the deliberate sin? Sinning according to breaking the 613. So you're going to keep breaking these commandments, going to the temple, thinking God's going to forgive you because you handed off your, your dove, bull, or goat. There's no forgiveness there. Christ once for all bloody sacrifice on the cross was the last sacrifice. So they have the temple. Now, this temple was destroyed. It was, you could, this is not even Christian, this is history. In AD 70, Rome invaded Jerusalem, destroyed the temple. It's gone. <laughs> so now, the Hebrew people, the Jews of today, who do not believe that Christ is the Messiah, they will wail at an old wall, sticking notes in the crack, begging God to either send the Messiah or get us another temple because we have no way to be forgiven. This is why they want the third temple built. Okay, so we got the temple, 2 Corinthians, excuse me, 2 Thessalonians. You got the temple, the lawless one establishes himself in the temple. So... <laughs> Do 
Jesus already came back if, if this is true. So there's option number one. Jesus came back in AD 70. He says it right here. The temple was destroyed. Where's the temple, McMillan? Where is, oh, it's not here, is it? Okay, then Jesus already came back. I knew it. <laughs> so that's option number one. Jesus came back, so we're, we're, you're now in the tribulation. Then we got a proof text. They were creating stuff out of other words that it's not an event. Then we gotta, we gotta go all over the place. We're not in a tribulation. Jesus has not come back. Okay, so clearly that's not the case. <laughs> also, if Jesus came back, then Jesus would have came back at the exact same time that Rome invaded Jerusalem. The exact same time. I, I just don't think that he would do that. And this clearly doesn't seem like heaven. And if it's tribulation, why is grace even involved? See how you just cognitive dissonance. You go, oh, gotta go here, gotta go here, gotta go here. Oh, no, 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 you're wrong. You should listen to so-and-so. But because of Darby... Because of proof texting, but also because of the Left Behind book series, <laughs> which was proof texting combined with pop culture, combined with a dumpster fire, combined with the most best-selling religious book besides the Bible of all time. Boom! Now most people think tons of error, but you got the temple. Okay, here's the other option according to Second Thessalonians. So, Second Thessalonians says the lawless one will establish himself in the temple, declare themselves as God. Okay, so if that's the case, then Jesus already came back. I don't agree with that. <laughs> Death is still here. <laughs> People still die every day. Jesus even said, I will destroy death. <laughs> okay, option number two. There has to be another temple built. This is why <laughs> I'm triggered right now. I'm trying to trying to control <laughs> control my words here. This is why so many people who finagle a fear-based end times theology want things to get worse. They want things to create an individual person that they can call antichrist, that they can call lawless one. That way they can get a, a third temple built because once they do, then this person will establish themselves in the temple and declare themselves as God. Then Jesus will come back and kill him and then we're good to go. Got to have a third temple. And it has to be a temple of the Jews and a lawless one who is teaching the perfection of the law. You must follow the law perfectly. Then Jesus is going to come back to that. So those are the only two options. Or a third option. <laughs> and this is what I believe. Paul didn't know when Jesus was going to come back. He is simply encouraging this extremely persecuted group of the ecclesia in Thessalonica around the time of Nero. You know, if you do any research on what Nero was doing to the early church, he was uh, making uh, street lamps out of them, setting them on fire. Lots of bad things were happening through Nero. And many people are like, oh, Nero is the lawless one. Well, it can't be Nero because Nero was not teaching the law. Nero was not a Hebrew person. He was a Greek. <laughs> so this is just Paul encouraging them. Paul saying, hey, we're dealing with the same thing over here in Corinth everywhere we go. The Judaizers are coming behind us. It's a specific individual who followed Paul around from city to city to city, being a thorn in his flesh, appearing as an angel of light, masquerading in the same way Satan did, teaching lawlessness, teaching you thou shalt, teaching you you better or else, if you don't this, ignoring the gospel, ignoring Jesus, not wanting anything to do with grace, anything to do with the message of Christ as the Messiah. Paul is saying, God is eventually going to overthrow them. And this delusion that this individual is believing, you know, they say God will give everybody a delusion who follows the lawless one. No, it is the lawless one who is following the delusion, which is a righteousness through behavior. The righteousness through the law, that is the delusion.
<laughs> study First Thessalonians, study Second Thessalonians, and read it that way. Take it or leave it. Are you just saying Paul can be wrong? No, I'm not saying Paul can be wrong, but I'm saying, actually, I am saying Paul can be wrong. <laughs> I'm saying Paul's a human. You know, Peter even said, Peter even said, Paul writes write some things, says some stuff that's hard to understand. <laughs> and a couple of times in Paul's letter, he even said, this is not from God. This is from me. <laughs> that's why I say the same thing. So this section of scripture where he said the lawless one will establish himself in the temple. Jesus will overthrow him. And then that's when Jesus will return. He doesn't know. This does not take away from the infallible scriptures. Instead, it lets you know that people are human and the Holy Spirit will teach you. And the scriptures will back up the Holy Spirit, not the other way around. The Spirit is eternal. The scriptures are what, 3,500 years old if you go all the way back to the beginning? not including the letters on this side of the cross. <sighs> so, who is the Antichrist? According to the Bible, there is no the Antichrist. There are many Antichrists, and that is everybody who says Jesus is not from God. The lawless one is not the Antichrist. According to the Bible, you would have to proof text. The lawless one is a specific individual teaching people to obey the commandments and the law, delighting in unrighteousness. You have nothing to fear about the end of time. If you're afraid of the end of time, remember this. Jesus said, well, Jesus didn't say this. The author of Hebrews said this about Jesus. <laughs> he will return without reference to sin. So if he's going to come back and not refer to any of your sins, it's going to be a good return. John said this in the book of 1 John. You can have confidence on your day of judgment because in this world, you're just like him. How are you just like him if you still sin? Because you're a new creation who is maturing, learning and growing, understanding that you want what God wants. You want to express your righteousness. You want to express love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, respect and self-control. You're a human. Everything that you do that is sinful is forgiven. That's the good news of the gospel. This is the grace of God, which will teach you how to live, not the law. <laughs> oh, all right, guys. So I hope this has encouraged you today. I hope it's brought to light some truth and some error. And you should always tell the truth about yourself. What's the truth? You're righteous. You're holy. You're blameless, you're a new creation, you're a child of God, there's nothing wrong with you, and you are awesome. So always tell the truth about yourself, always be yourself. Love y'all. Bye.